Hello guys and welcome back to my channel. In this video, we will be learning about the cerebellum. To begin with, the cerebellum is the largest part of the hindbrain. It is situated in the posterior cranial fossa behind the pons and the medulla as you can see right here. The cerebellum has three main functions. First is maintaining the tone of muscles, second is balance and third is coordination. Moving on to the relations of the cerebellum, anteriorly it is related to the fourth ventricle, the pons and the medulla. Postro inferiorly it is related to the squamous occipital bone and superiorly it is related to the tentorium cerebelli. Now let's move on to the external features of the cerebellum. Now this is an external caudal view of the cerebellum. The cerebellum consists of two cerebellar hemispheres that are united to each other by a median vermis that you see right here. It has two surfaces, the superior surface and an inferior surface. The inferior surface shows a deep median notch which is called the vallecula which separates the right and the left convex hemispheres. This is an external anterior view of the cerebellum and you can see the vallecula more clearly in this diagram right here. This is the vallecula. Now looking at this cross sectional lateral view of the cerebellum, each hemisphere of the cerebellum is divided into three lobes. First is the anterior lobe. The anterior lobe lies on the anterior part of the superior surface. It is separated from the middle lobe by the fissura prima that you see right here. This is a fissure that separates the anterior lobe from the middle lobe. The middle lobe that you see right here is the largest of the three lobes. It is situated on both surfaces that is the superior and the inferior surfaces. It is limited in front by the fissura prima on the superior surface and by the posterolateral fissure that you see right here on the inferior surface. Finally, the flocculonodular lobe that you see right here is the smallest lobe of the cerebellum. It lies on the inferior surface in front of the posterolateral fissure right here. Now, concising the important points that we have learnt, the cerebellum is the largest part of the hindbrain. It is situated in the posterior cranial fossa behind the pons and medulla. The cerebellum has three main functions. Maintain the tone of muscles, balance and coordination. Moving to the relations, anteriorly the cerebellum is related to the fourth ventricle, pons and medulla. Postero inferiorly it is related to the squamous occipital bone. Superiorly it is related to the tentorium cerebelli. Moving on to the external features, the cerebellum consists of two cerebellar hemispheres that are united to each other through a median vermis. It has two surfaces, the superior and inferior surfaces. Inferior surface shows a deep median notch called the vallecula which separates the right and left convex hemispheres. Each hemisphere is divided into three lobes. The anterior lobe lies on the anterior part of the superior surface. It is separated from the middle lobe by the fissura prima. The middle lobe is the largest of the three lobes situated on both its surfaces. It is limited in the front by the fissura prima on the superior surface and by the posterolateral fissure on the inferior surface. The flocculonodular lobe is the smallest lobe of the cerebellum. It lies on the inferior surface in front of the posterolateral fissure. Now after looking at the external features of the cerebellum, we will be looking at the parts of the cerebellum. The cerebellum is divided into numerous small parts by fissures. Now looking at the first fissure, the horizontal fissure that you see right here separates the superior surface from the inferior surface of the cerebellum. The second fissure is the fissura prima or the primary fissure right here. It separates the anterior lobe from the middle lobe on the superior surface of the cerebellum. Third is the posterolateral fissure right here that separates the middle lobe from the flocculonodular lobe on the inferior surface. Now 
Let us look at the parts of the vermis and the corresponding subdivisions of the cerebellar hemispheres. Now in this diagram, this is the superior surface of the cerebellum, this is the inferior surface and it is separated by a horizontal fissure right here. Okay. Now the first part of the vermis is the lingula that you see right here and it has no corresponding subdivision in the cerebellar hemisphere. Second is the central lobule that you see right here. Its corresponding subdivision on the cerebellar hemisphere is the ala that you see right here. Third is the culmen. The corresponding subdivision is the quadrangular lobule right here. Fourth is the declive. The corresponding subdivision is the simple lobule. Fourth is the folium right here and its corresponding subdivision in the cerebellar hemisphere is a superior semilunar lobule. Moving on to the next part is the tuber right here and its corresponding subdivision is the inferior semilunar lobule. Then comes the pyramid which has the corresponding biventral lobule. Then the uvula right here that has the corresponding subdivision tonsil. Finally, nodule and its corresponding subdivision on the cerebellar hemisphere is the flocculus. An easy way to remember the parts of the vermis is by using the mnemonic like Charlie Chaplin dancing for the party up north. Now the L in like stands for lingula. The C in Charlie stands for central lobule. The C in Chaplin stands for culmen. The D in dancing stands for declive. F in the four stands for folium. T in the the stands for tuber. P stands for pyramid. U for uvula. And N in north for nodule. Now concising these main points, the parts of the cerebellum. The cerebellum is divided into numerous small parts by the fissures. The horizontal fissure separates the superior surface from the inferior surface. The primary fissure separates the anterior lobe from the middle lobe on the superior surface of the cerebellum. The posterolateral fissure separates the middle lobe from the flocular nodular lobe on the inferior surface. Moving on to the parts of the vermis and the corresponding subdivisions of cerebellar hemisphere. First is the lingula which has no corresponding subdivision, central lobule which has ala, Culmen has quadrangular lobule, declive has simple lobule as the corresponding subdivision, folium, superior semilunar, semilunar lobule, tuber has inferior semilunar lobule, pyramid has biventral lobule, uvula has tonsil and nodule has flocculus. Next let us move on to the morphological and functional divisions of the cerebellum. First moving on to the morphological divisions, we have three divisions. First is archicerebellum, second paleocerebellum, third is neocerebellum. Now in this diagram, the archicerebellum is indicated in the blue color. The paleocerebellum is indicated in the pink color. And finally, the neocerebellum is indicated in the orange color. The archicerebellum that you see right here is the oldest part of the cerebellum. It includes the flocculonodular lobe and the lingula. It controls the axial musculature and bilateral movements used for locomotion and maintenance of equilibrium. The paleocerebellum indicated in pink color is made up of the anterior lobe and the pyramid and uvula of the inferior vermis. It controls the tone, posture and crude movements of limbs. The neocerebellum which is indicated in orange color is composed of the posterior or the middle lobe except the pyramid and the uvula of the inferior vermis. It is primarily concerned with the regulation of fine movements of the body. Now let us look at the functional divisions of the cerebellum by looking at this diagram. The anterior and posterior lobes are organized into three longitudinal zones. The lateral zone, the intermediate zone and the vermis. The lateral zone that you see right here is connected with the association areas of the brain and is involved in planning, programming 
and coordination of muscular activities of the distal parts of the limbs. The intermediate zone right here is concerned with the control of muscles of the flexor group. The median zone or the vermis is concerned with the control of the extensor muscles, the trunk, neck, shoulders and hips. Finally, looking at the flocculonodular lobe right here, this is an extra lobe. This lobe functions with the vestibular system in controlling equilibrium. Concising the important points, the morphological and functional divisions of cerebellum. The archaecerebellum phylogenetically is the oldest part of the cerebellum. It includes the flocculonodular lobe and the lingula. It controls the axial musculature and bilateral movements used for locomotion and maintenance of equilibrium. The paleocerebellum cerebellum is made up of anterior lobe and pyramid and uvula of the inferior vermis. It controls the tone, posture and crude movements of the limbs. The neocerebellum is made up of the posterior or middle lobe except the pyramid and uvula of the inferior vermis. It is primarily concerned with the regulation of fine movements of the body. Under the functional divisions, the anterior and posterior lobes of the cerebellum are organized into three longitudinal zones, the lateral, intermediate and the vermis. The lateral zone is connected with association areas of the brain and is involved in planning, programming and coordination of muscular activities of the distal parts of the limbs. The intermediate zone is concerned with the control of muscles of the flexor group. The median zone or the vermis is concerned with the control of the extensor muscles, trunk, neck, shoulders and hips. The flocculonodular lobe is an extra lobe. This lobe functions with vestibular system in controlling equilibrium. Moving on to the connections of the cerebellum, the fibers entering or leaving the cerebellum are grouped to form three peduncles which connect the cerebellum to the midbrain, pons and medulla. The three peduncles are the superior cerebellar peduncle, the middle cerebellar peduncle and the inferior cerebellar peduncle. The superior cerebellar peduncle connects the cerebellum to the midbrain. The middle cerebellar peduncle connects the cerebellum to the pons. And finally, the inferior cerebellar peduncle connects the cerebellum to the medulla. Each of the cerebellar peduncles carry efferent and efferent fibers. Example of which is pontocerebellar fibers, the olivocerebellar and reticulocerebellar tract and the ventral spinocerebellar tract. Concising the connections of the cerebellum, the fibers entering or leaving the cerebellum are grouped to form three peduncles which connect the cerebellum to the midbrain, pons and medulla. First is the superior cerebellar peduncle which connects the cerebellum to midbrain. It has two afferent tracts and four efferent tracts. The middle cerebellar peduncle connects the cerebellum to the pons. It has one efferent tract that is a pontocerebellar. Third is the inferior cerebellar peduncle which connects the cerebellum to the medulla oblongata. It has nine efferent tracts and three efferent tracts. Moving on to the grey matter of the cerebellum, there are four pairs of nuclei. First is the nucleus dentatus, also called the dentate nucleus. This is a pair of dentate nucleus. Second is the nucleus globosus also called the globose nucleus. This is a pair of globose nucleus. Third is the nucleus emboliformis, also called the emboliform nucleus. This is the pair. And finally, the fourth is the nucleus fastigiae, right here. This is the last pair of nuclei. The dentate nucleus is neocerebellar. The emboliform nucleus is paleocerebellar and the nucleus fastigiae is archaecerebellar. Now let's look at the histological structure of the cerebellum. The grey matter consists of basket cells which inhibit the body of the Purkinje cells right here. Now the cortex contains three layers which are as follows. First is the molecular layer that you see right here. Then is the intermediate layer 
and finally comes the inner layer. Now let's look at the molecular layer. The molecular layer consists of unmyelinated nerve fibers which are derived from the parallel fibers of axons of granule cells. The intermediate layer that you see right here consists of single layer of cell bodies of Purkinje cells. And finally, the inner layer which is the granular layer consists of cell bodies and dendrites of granule cells and Golgi bodies. Now let's look at the neurons of the cerebellum. There are five types in which four types that is Purkinje, Basket, Stellate and Golgi types of neurons are inhibitory. Only the granular cells are excitatory. Now in this diagram we can see the Purkinje neurons that you see right here. They are the characteristic neurons of the cerebellum and the granular cells as well as the Golgi cells which can be seen in the granular layer as we mentioned earlier. Looking at the Purkinje cells that you see right here, they are large cells of flask shape. Next, looking at the granule cells, it is a small rounded cell with dendrites. Then, looking at the Golgi cells, they are the largest neurons. They receive input from the parallel fibers, climbing fibers and mossy fibers and output to the granule cells. Now concising the important points, the grey matter of the cerebellum, it consists of cerebellar cortex and the cerebellar nuclei. There are four pairs of nuclei. Nucleus dentatus is neocerebellar, nucleus globosus, nucleus emboliformis is paleocerebellar and finally the nucleus fastigiae is archicerebellar. Moving on to the histological structure, the grey matter contains basket cells which inhibit body of Purkinje cells. The cortex contains three layers as follows. First is the molecular layer which consists of unmyelinated nerve fibers which are derived from the parallel fibers of axons of granule cells. The intermediate layer contains single layer of cell bodies of Purkinje cells. And finally the inner layer is made up of cell bodies and dendrites of granule cells and Golgi cells. Looking at the neurons of the cerebellum, there are five types in which four types that is the Purkinje, Basket, Stellate, Golgi are inhibitory while only the granular cells are excitatory. Mentioning the important points under each cells, the Purkinje cells are the characteristic cells of the cerebellum. The large, it is a large cell of flask shape. It gets stimulated by the climbing fibers coming from the inferior olivary nucleus. These are the main output neurons. The granule cells is a small rounded cell with dendrites. The stellate cell and basket cell which could not be seen in that diagram have the cell bodies which are at right angles to the long axis of the folium which is a part of the vermis. The Golgi cells they are the largest neurons. They receive input from the parallel fibers, climbing fibers and mossy fibers and output to the granule cells. Next. Mentioning about the sensory fibers of the cerebellum, the efferent connections of the cerebellum are through mossy and climbing fibers. The important point that we need to remember under mossy fibers and climbing fibers are that the mossy fibers release neurotransmitter and glutamate. The climbing fibers release the neurotransmitter aspartate. Moving on to the blood supply of the cerebellum, the cerebellum is supplied by two superior cerebellar arteries two anterior inferior cerebellar arteries and two posterior inferior cerebellar arteries. The superior cerebellar artery is a branch of the basilar artery that you see right here. The anterior inferior cerebellar artery is also a branch of the basilar artery while the posterior inferior cerebellar artery is a branch of the vertebral artery. Now, concising the important points under the blood supply, the cerebellum is supplied by two superior cerebellar arteries, two anterior inferior cerebellar arteries and two posterior inferior cerebellar arteries. The superior cerebellar is a branch of the basilar artery, anterior inferior cere cerebellar is a branch of the basilar artery, the posterior inferior cerebellar is a branch of the vertebral artery.
the veins drain into neighboring ve venous sinuses. Now looking at the functions of the cerebellum, the cerebellum controls the same side of the body, that is the ipsilateral side. It coordinates voluntary movements so that they are smooth, balanced and accurate. The cerebellum controls tone, posture and equilibrium. It controls the movements of the eyeballs. The floculonodular lobe is involved in the maintenance of muscle tone and posture. The vermis controls axial muscles and thus controls posture. The cerebellum functions as a comparator. That is, it receives information from cerebrum and cerebrum and spinal cord. It corrects and modifies ongoing movements through tracks. Finally, the neocerebellum is responsible for the fine tuning of motor performance for precise movements. Finally, let's look at the clinical anatomy. In cerebellar dysfunction, the vermis lesions lead to truncal ataxia, that is nystagmus. Anterior lobe lesions, that is lesion of the anterior lobe, causes gait ataxia, that is incoordination which leads to a staggering gait. In a neocerebellar lesion, it causes incoordination of voluntary movements of the upper limbs. It results in intentional tremor, action tremor and overshoot movements. Speech is also defective. Thrombosis of one of the six arteries nurturing the cerebellum leads to cerebellum cognitive effective syndrome. I hope you found this video helpful. To get the notes of cerebellum as well as notes on other topics of anatomy, physiology, biomechanics, psychology and pathology, visit my Instagram page, the link to which is given in the description below. To get updates on my latest videos, click the subscribe button. To get notifications, tap on the bell icon. Thank you for watching.